All right, so we continue in Acts chapter 4 today. We're going to be in verses 23 through 35. And just to set the table, if you remember what's happened is Pentecost has come, the Holy Spirit's come. Peter and John are going into the temple for prayer, afternoon prayers. They go past the lame man. He asks for alms. Peter looks down at him, and he says, I got something better than that. And he says, stand up. So here's this man been lame all his life, 40 years, stands up and walks into the temple with him. Everybody in the temple sees it. They're gathering. They roll outside to the portico, uh, Solomon's portico, and they've caused a huge uproar because everybody in the temple is focusing on what's happening with this lame man. And he's, he's alive, and he's walking, and he's dancing, and he's jumping up and down, and he's praising God. And so then the, the Sadducees, or the Sanhedrin, made up of the Sadducees and the Pharisees, they pull Peter and John. They, put, they, they grab Peter and John, they, and because they, Peter gives his second sermon, they grab him, they put him in jail overnight. The next morning, they gather him around, and everybody has seen the lame man, so they can't dispute it. So what do they do? They say, "Stop talking about this guy, Jesus." Paraphrasing, and they said, "We'll let you go, but you got to stop talking." And Peter and John look at him, basically say, "So you're saying we need to listen to man, not to God? Forget it. We're not doing that." And so they leave and they walk out. And so here's where we pick up our story in uh, four, chapter 4, verse 23. It says, When they had been released, this is Peter and John, they went to their own companions and reported all that the chief priests and the elders had said to them. And when they heard this, they lifted their voices to God in one accord and said, O Lord, it is you who made the heaven and the earth and the sea and all that is in them, who by the Holy Spirit through the mouth of our father David, your servant, said, why did the Gentiles rage? This is Psalm one, uh, Psalm, Psalm two. Uh, why did the Gentiles rage and the peoples devise futile things? The kings of the earth took their stand, and the rulers were gathered together against the Lord and against His Christ. For truly, in this city, there were gathered together against your holy servant Jesus. For you anointed both Herod and Pontius Pilate, along with the Gentiles and the people of Israel. So if you want to mark verse 27, that's God's sovereignty right there. So to do whatever your hand or purpose predestined to occur. And now, Lord, take note of their threats and grant your bondservants may speak your word with all confidence while you extend your hand to heal and the signs and wonders take place through the name of your holy servant, Jesus. And when they had prayed, the place where they gathered was shaken and they were all filled with the Holy Spirit and began to speak the word of God with boldness. And the congregation of those who believed were of one heart and soul, and not one of them claimed that anything belonging to him was his own, but all things were common property to them. And they had great power, and with great power, the apostles were giving testimony to the resurrection of the Lord Jesus, and abundant grace was upon all of them. For there was not a needy person among them. All who were owners of land or houses would sell them and bring proceeds of the sales and lay them at the apostles' feet and they would be distributed to each as any had need. So, what are we going to do today? What we're going to do is, we're going to look at, the, this is, so we talked about last week, this was the first persecution of the church, which was when they grabbed Peter and John and put them in jail. And the first persecution of the church didn't happen by the godless pagans or the Gentiles, it happened by the quote-unquote religious Jews. And we spent a lot of time talking last week about how the, that the Jews had got the Jewish leadership had gotten so far away from Scripture and what it really meant, and that, that basically they were a group of people that were on the graph, right? They were taking money because they would get money from the temple, from the money changers. They would get money. You got to remember, they were the ones. The Sanhedrin were the ones who appointed the tax collectors. But yet then they looked down on the tax collectors, but yet they were getting a cut from the tax collectors. And they were splitting things with Rome. And so the whole idea with Roman occupation was, hey, Sanhedrin, you guys just run everything. Keep the people from rebelling, right? You're in control of them, and we're all good. We'll take care of you. You'll take care of us. They were anti-religious is what they were. They were really secular. Um, in fact, the, 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 the Sadducees were very secular in and amongst themselves. So what do we see here? We see the first persecution of the church. And so the persecution of the church starts when they say, stop talking in the name of Jesus. And they send them out. And so Peter and John, here's where we pick up. They go back, they were released, and they go to their companions, and then they all came together and they lifted up their voice in one accord. In other words, what was there? Unity. This is really important. Congress was talking about last week in his sermon. Um, 
unity. They were one. They were of one accord. And so they come up, they start with this prayer. And so when we look at this, you know, people ask or make comments all the time. What does a church in America need? The church in America needs revival, right? Last year, 2021, was our year revival. We had our big tech revival out here for four days. And But the reality is, you know where revival comes most effectively? For persecution. Throughout the history of the church. In fact, the, it, it, when we, when, and we'll get here in the New Testament in, in the book of Acts, is that one of the problems that the Lord had with the, with the, with the Christians is they were too Jerusalem-focused. So what did he do? He turned the heat up and he scattered them around. By, he did that by the persecution coming to the church. So what does persecution do for the church? How does it make the church stronger? I'll give you a couple ideas. One, it burns impurity out of the church. It drives away nominal worldly attenders. It separates the church from the world. It drives the church to prayer. It unites the church in brotherly love. And it causes the church to expand numerically. If you don't believe it, look at the church in communist China. It's growing. Look at the church in the United States. It's declining. Figure it out. In China, the church is persecuted, but yet it grows. In America, we're not persecuted yet, and we're not growing. Maybe we need a healthy dose of persecution. I mean, I, I don't really want that because I don't like to suffer any more than anybody else does. So I'll leave it to the sovereignty of God to determine when he's going to allow the, the church in America to be persecuted. And I think it's coming, by the way. I mean, you, all you have to do is just look at the things, the quote-unquote hate speech. Go to Europe. Go to England. And say, stand up in public and say something about homosexuality. And you can be arrested and fined. It's England, people. And it happens all over Europe. So don't think that it's not coming here. So what do we need to do? We need to understand if, if and, I, and I label persecution because I put suffering with it because I think they go together. And they're similar problem, right? Because if you're under persecution, you're suffering, right? But we also go through suffering in it. In an, and so what we want to do is we want to take the scripture we have here and glean out of it how do we prepare to respond to persecution. And these principles will apply to persecution, and they apply to suffering. Just like the book of, you know, in, in the church today, the American church, we don't have a great, I don't think, adequate, and I'm talking about the church overall, adequate theology when it comes to suffering. Because what so many of the churches in this country <clears throat> want to basically say is that you have come to, come to know Jesus so you can have a prosperous life and everything will be good. <clears throat> Doesn't work that way doesn't work that way. So our text reveals response to the early church to persecution. And it's kind of, we're using kind of like a snapshot of those responding. So what did they do? And here's my premise. Is they responded to their persecution by affirming their commitment to God. That's the first thing they did, is they responded by affirming their commitment to God. Because what we got to do is we got to take the text and tear it apart and learn how to apply it to our lives. So we say, okay, well, what's going to happen? And you say, I, I don't want to deal with persecution. Okay, but you will have suffering in our lives. We all do. So how do we deal with it? Well, the first thing you do is you affirm your commitment to God. Because when persecution comes along, it's one of the first things I said. What does it do? It separates the wheat from the chaff. Right? It takes the nominal Christians. They're just kind of there, like, you know, because we're supposed to do that. The church gets persecuted. They're the first ones backing up saying, yeah, no, I'm not affiliated with the church. No anything to do with that. So our aim is to glorify God, right? And we follow this, what, in fact, it's, it's interesting because what we look at is our response is, is we, we affirm our commitment to God, and then we're going to look at our second thing later, which is we affirm our commitment to, pe to our people, to Christians, and then we, we affirm our commitment to the work in the world, which is what our, our vision statement is for the church. Loving God, loving people, serving the world. It's what it is. We get all of that right here in these 12 verses. Interesting. So when persecution comes, we need to affirm these priorities. So the first one is, we'll see, and what I started was I just added, so if we affirm our commitment to God, how do we do that? Well, then there's four points that we pull out of, this, out of the text. The first one is we affirm our commitment through corporate prayer. Look what happened with them, verse 24. And when they heard this, this was their report, because remember, when Peter and John are standing before the Sanhedrin, except the lame guy, nobody else is around. So they come back and they say, hey, man, here's what happened. Here's what they said. And then what happened? They did what? 
When they heard this, this is they, the Christians that were around them, the new converts, they lifted their voices to God in one accord and started this prayer. Now, I think what we have here is the prayer of one man voicing it, but they were all in accord on what they were doing with this. Corporate prayer. Um, interesting as we look at the corporate prayer. The remarkable thing about prayer is that it is effective in reaching out to God, but we have to be careful to think about, is our, are our prayers focused on the kingdom and his will and his duty, or our duties to him, or are our prayers self-centered? And I think that's the biggest challenge. I know it is for me, because I find myself in my own prayer life saying, I'm paraphrasing here, but you know, hey, I, help me with this, do this, do this, do that, that, that. Well, those are all self-focused prayers. Where our prayers need to start is focusing outward on God and what His desires are and His desires for us. Isn't it interesting when we look at the Lord's Prayer in Matthew 6, well, how does it start out, right? Think about how, think about how it, it starts. It says, Our Father who art in heaven, hallowed be your name. Thy kingdom come, thy will be done on earth as it is in heaven. So when you look at that, it starts out, their prayers don't start at the, the Lord's Prayer, how he directed us to pray. It doesn't start out with, hey man, fill up this, take care of this, fix this problem, do that. It starts out with our Father who's in heaven, hallowed be your name. So it, sorry, our prayers need to start there. At the end of that per, at the Lord's Prayer, it comes in with, give us this day our daily bread. And what is that? He's just asking, just give us enough to sustain us. He's not saying, hey, man, give me all these great things and lots of uh, assets and lots of toys and all that. He says, no, just give me enough to eat. That's what, right? Proverbs talks about that, where it says, you know, I don't want to be too poor or I steal, and I don't want to be too rich because then I'll forget about God. Similar process here. So isn't it interesting when we look at, look at our verses, they spend five verses, <coughs> verses 24 through 28, praying, hallowing God's name before praying that the kingdom would come. And then their, their request, their only request is verse 29. Spend five verses. Look at these. Five verses. 24. O oh Lord, it is you who made the heavens and the earth and the sea and all that is in them. What are they doing? They're reaffirming their commitment to God. In other words, who is God? Back up, stand on the corner and say, who is God? And look, it goes on. And who by the Holy Spirit through the mouth of David, your servant, said, why did the Gentiles rage? Right? Why did the people do futile things? The kings of the earth took their stand. That would be, if we go down to the next verse, you'll see who that is. That's Herod and Pilate. Right? And the rulers of them. And they rallied against the Lord. But look, they, they're reminding themselves who God is. Continue on down. For truly, in this city, they're gathered together your holy servant Jesus, you anointed, you, both Herod and Pilate, along with the Gentiles and the people of Israel, to do whatever your hand and purpose predestined them to occur. So what are they saying? They're saying, wait a minute, let's remember, Jesus wasn't killed, Jesus voluntarily went, and the ones that allowed that to happen, which would be the Gentiles, Pilate and Herod, the Jews, the Sanhedrin, and, and all, by the way, all of the people that were standing when Pilate said, I find no fault in this man, and what did they do? They said, what, you want Barabbas or Jesus? Barabbas, Barabbas, Barabbas. All these people were doing that. So they all came against God. They all came against God by coming against Christ. And they're reminding themselves in their prayer. And here's in verse 28. And now, Lord, you take note of their threats and grant your bond servants may speak your word in all confidence. Persecution's coming. Isn't it interesting that here in their prayer to God, they don't say, and keep the persecution away. Lord, let our lives just be perfect. No, they spend five verses, 24 through 28, hallowing God's name. And then in 29, they come along and they say, And now, Lord, take note of the threats hmm. and grant your bond servants may speak your word with all confidence. So what do they say? <coughs> Lord, take note of the threats because we see it. In other words, they realize if the Sanhedrin, if the rulers and the leaders have come against Peter and John, they're coming against us. And so what do they say? Take heed of the threats. In other words, we know they're coming against us. We know persecution's coming. And you know what they don't say? Don't allow it to come. Look what they said. Look at verse 29. This is, this is our, our verse, uh, verse 29. 
and grant your bond servants may speak your word with all confidence. In other words, when the persecution comes, give me the boldness to stand firm for the Lord. See, those are not prayers of fix this, do this, make my life easier. They never do get around to praying for their own needs. No prayer, they don't get around to that. Mm. Secondly, what does corporate prayer do? I'm going to just, corporate prayer lifts our eyes to the mighty and inexhaustible resources of God. Again, verse 24. You made the heavens and the earth. That reflects Old Testament. In other words, he's going back, reminding them of the Old Testament. He is able to do far more than we could ask. Somebody read Ephesians 3.20. is described as incense in the bowls around the throne that are pleasing to the Lord. So why would we not want to come together to pray corporately for things? You know, right now, uh, with the year of missions, we ought to be praying about missions. Well, if all of us are praying, it doesn't mean, corporate prayer, by the way, doesn't mean we all have to be in the same room at the same time. That is isn't. That is one aspect of corporate prayer. But if we all pray, can you imagine what God could do through this small church? as we all individually and together are praying that he would reveal missions to us that we can spend our money on. Remember, we are going to give away $100,000 this year. We gave away seventy dollars last year to missions. I mean, focus on that. That's a quarter of our entire budget will go to missions. We need to be praying that God would raise up missionaries, local, regional, national, international, that we can support. That's kingdom focus. So it tells us that what we do is we take our prayers off me and on him and what he wants us to do. I mean, we got VBS starting tonight. It's a great thing. Well, I mean, prayer for VBS, that lives can be changed. I talked about a few weeks ago in church. Our biggest mission field is right on this campus. It's young people who have not yet professed Jesus Christ as Lord and Savior. We have a mission field right here. We don't have to go overseas. We need to go overseas, but we don't have to. We've got to remember that missions are like this. Missions are right here. Missions are here. Missions are here. Missions are here. Missions are here. They're all the way. Where's God calling you to be a missionary? Where's God calling you to support missionaries? Do you know of some? Keep your eyes out for them, right? Corporate prayer leads us to view God as who he really is. And that helps us because if we step back, we go, well, Lord, you're sovereignly in charge. I got something going on right now. Details are irrelevant. And it should be freaking me out somewhat. But you know why it's not? Because God has reminded me, you know what? This same thing has happened before. Oh, yeah, you came through the first time. Yeah, you came through the second time it happened. You came through the third and the fourth and the fifth and the sixth. Well, he's come through so many times. Why am I going to worry about it and fret about it? That's a sin. So he's revealed to me, listen, I'm not perfect. There's plenty of other things I'm absolutely freaked out about. So don't think that I'm over here walking on, on hallowed ground, right? There's a lot of things that bother me. And we're, but, you know, it's that reminding. I go back and I do the same thing that they did. I go back and I affirm my commitment to God because he committed to me. And he said, I'll never leave you nor forsake you. And even if things go south, he'll, put, he'll be there. He'll be right there with me, arms out like this to catch me. And say, it's okay, come on, let's keep moving down the road. So, he is able to do far more than we can even think. That's what Ephesians 3.20 says. So when we're going through this kind of thing, when you're going through suffering, remember who God is. Go back and read Ephesians 3.20 and stand on it, man. Camp on that verse. That's really important. And you know what? The last thing is corporate prayer brings answers. 
How do we know that God answered their prayer? He shook the building. Wow. We haven't had anything that dramatic yet, right? Um, God immediately answered by shaking the place and filling them with the Holy Spirit. Isn't it interesting? I, I love when it says that. Um, and when they had prayed, this is verse 31. Look, in other words, they prayed, and when they had prayed. So it's cause and effect. If you do this, now you get that. So, and when they had prayed, the place that they had gathered in began, was shaken. They were filled with the Spirit and began to speak the word of God with boldness. Now, remember, when we're talking about being filled, it says they were all filled with the Spirit. Now, remember, don't get hung up on this, okay? They were all indwelt with the Spirit at Pentecost or at salvation as some of these others. When they got saved, they were indwelt with the Spirit. So, I'm indwelt. It's exactly what Fred said this morning. And he said, hey, you know, it says his mercies and grace are fresh every day. No, well, they are, but there's a whole lot more things that are fresh every day. That's being filled with the Spirit. He's indwelt, but he's reminded himself, wow, man, God's in charge. He's got it. He's going to be here for this. He's going to be with me through this. All of these things come together so that when we get a new filling of the Spirit, that's what we need. What does a new filling of the Spirit, what was it doing for them? Again, they were already indwelt with the Spirit, but God was reminding them through a new filling of the Spirit, Woo! you're in charge. I know you are. I just said it. I'm going to repeat it again. Right? You're the ones that created the heaven and the earth. You're the one that created me. You're the one that saved me. You're sovereign. That means what's going on in my life isn't taking you by surprise. You've got a plan. I don't understand the plan. And it's interesting. There's got answered right away. Now, God often, God works through believing in prayer, right? There, but we need to be specific in our prayers for that. We need to be specific that God would open up missions for us to support this year. That's key, you know? And we should be praying for those that are on the mission team, right, that are looking at those things. So when we, when we face persecutions and prosecution, persecution and trials, uh, we let the problems bring us together. Here's the key. It's what Jay was saying earlier. What bring us together with other believers to bring our needs before God. Sometimes what happens is there are prayers. And that's why I always talk about when people in this class have prayer requests, what it is is it's a megaphone that they are shouting out, not to God. They're shouting it to you and me and saying, this is so burdening on me, I can't deal with it myself. I need your prayers also. That's what Paul said, right? Paul, read Paul's letters again and again and again. Paraphrasing, you know, he says, I, I can't sustain my ministry without your prayers. I didn't say I can't sustain it without your money, without what he says, without your prayers. So it's the same thing with our missions, right? Our missionaries, do they need our money? Sure. They could use it. Do they have to have it? What would they, if you said you want money or prayers, they take prayers. Wow. We get to do both. What a blessing we are. But man, don't, don't, don't ignore the prayer part because they need it. Right? Now, we affirm our commitment to God. Here's a second one. By having a high view of his sovereignty. It's easy to slip back and go, oh my God, are you there? Do you really know what's going on? He knows what's going on. So let's look at a couple of ideas here. Uh, the word used to address God comes from the Greek word which means despot. You know, it's interesting because we think of a despot as, in, in English, right, it's, a, um, uh, it's an evil person. But in the Greek, this word means absolute master or sovereign lord. Hmm. The view of God. So the Bible clearly talks about the absolute sovereignty of God. And we have to remember that. God is sovereign over all things. Hmm. Isn't it interesting? Bob mentioned that earlier when he was talking about Connie. Because what did he say? The sovereignty of God. God brought Connie into Bob's life for all these years. And he said, man, if it wasn't for how God instituted Connie, I wouldn't be in this church. I don't know where I'd be. See, that's recognition of the fact that God had a plan. God had a plan to get Bob here, and it was Connie. Isn't that cool? you got, you got to slow down and look at that, how cool that is. Right? Amen. Yeah, I mean, if we don't, then it's like, oh, yeah, just kind of everything just kind of happens. But that's what worldly people think circumstance, happenstance. No. Sovereignty of God. He's got me here for a reason. I don't know why, but you know what? I'm going to look while I'm here, where, I, where he's got me, I want to look at and figure out how can I serve him right here. What's his plan for me? Because he's got a plan. He never just drops us in a spot and goes, yeah, just chill for a while. Well, I actually shouldn't say that. I think sometimes he does when we're not responding to what he wants us to do. And he'll just say, okay, you want to sit out over there, sit on the sidelines for a while? Go ahead. 
And so I think when we look at this, and we, we look at verses 27 and 28 and 29, or 27 and 28, it says, They were gathered together against your holy servant, Jesus. Who was? The Herod and Pilate, right? The Gentiles and the people of Israel. They were gathered against it. And then they recognized, look at verse 28, to do whatever your hand and your purpose predestined to occur. They were reminding themselves of the sovereignty of God. See, the wicked men that persecuted the church, why? Because God allowed them to. Why did he allow them to? Because in his sovereign plan, Jesus needed to go to the cross. And his plan was to allow Jesus to go to the cross by the hands of wicked men. Look, he did the same thing with Pharaoh. Right? So God can use anything in those circumstances to change things around. And he will use evil people sometimes. So, we have, next we affirm our commitment to God by knowing and applying his word. Because isn't that what they did? Look at verse, look at, uh, verse 26, which is a quote from Psalm 2, 1 and 2. Old quote, brought to life. And these are these verses that I, I don't believe, I know, are when Jesus ascended, uh, when, before Jesus ascended to heaven, in those 40 days he was with the disciples. He was, he was and the people. He was explaining to them, to, allowing them to see him through the Old Testament coming through. And this is another one of those verses. So this person who's leading this prayer quotes this verse from the heart and says, and again, I believe he did because I don't think he opened up a scroll, could have, but I don't think so. It's too spontaneous. Why did the Gentiles rage and the peoples devise futile things? What are the futile things? Hey, let's kill Jesus. Yeah, we'll stamp out this, we'll stamp out this stuff by doing that. It says, the kings of the earth took their stand, and the rulers gathered together against the Lord and against Christ. You know what's interesting is when he when they when they quote that, he's quoting David, and then what is he doing? He's going to quote it, because he knows it, and then he's going to apply it. Now watch the application. Switch pages here. The application is in Psalm 2, verse 4. Listen to this. Because the psalm goes on and says. He who sits in the heavens laughs. The Lord scoffs at them. So who does the Lord laugh and scoff at? These people, these Gentiles and these leaders and these Israelites who had come against the Lord. He scoffs at them. He says, yeah, go ahead. Bring your plan together. It's not going to affect mine. That's, that's, that's what the Lord says in that. So, in other words, it's utterly futile and foolish to fight against a sovereign God. God's enemies <clears throat> thought they'd kill Jesus, but he triumphed over them, over his enemies, when he raised Jesus from the dead. And, and, don't miss this, he's coming again to judge the living and the dead, and he will reign as God's anointed on David's throne. Don't forget that. You know, sometimes we need to remember that, especially when the chaos is going on around us. And the chaos in this world right now, with all of the lunacy <clears throat> that's out there. It's being taught in the schools. It's being taught in many other places. Not to get too political, but have you seen the latest is that if you, if schools want to continue to get their federal funding for reduced and free lunch in public schools, then public schools have to affirm and teach the trans stuff. Mm. I mean, that's the craziness going on in the world. And so I'm not trying to get political, but what I'm trying to remind you is that's the crazy stuff that's coming, and that's the stuff when I have to remind myself, right, that God, Jesus, is coming again to judge, right, and he is God's anointed, and he's going to be on the throne, and this foolishness will mean nothing. That's the way we have to look at it. i got a job to do in the interim, right? So if they're coming against, and they're coming against the church, which is what that is, I got a job to do because we're being persecuted for that. So I got a job to do to let people know God's in charge. And we can stand against some of this stuff. The best prayers are based on Scripture and then apply it directly to the situation and the needs. Scripture, you know, take a, take a Scripture and write a prayer using the Scripture. It's a great exercise to go, go through because then it reminds you now. So, so the best prayer, so you say, I'm not really great at praying, okay? Well, then know some scripture and apply the scripture as a prayer. It's a simple way to do it. Um, it's interesting because when you look at why is it important to know? I think it's really important to know God's word. And here's what we're going to look at. Proverbs 1. Proverbs 1 is great because it talks about wisdom and the wisdom of man. <clears throat> 
and seeking wisdom. Um, it talks about why you need to seek wisdom. I think I had this. Maybe not. So, listen to this. This is about seek. It says, it says seek wisdom. And this, this is great. Wisdom shouts in the streets. She cries in the public square. She calls to the crowds along the main street and those gathered in front of the city gate. How long, you simpletons, will you insist on being simple-minded? This is out of the NLT uh, uh, paraphrase. How long will you mockers relish your mocking? How long will you fools hate knowledge? Come and listen to my counsel. I'll share my heart with you and make you wise. Right? I've called you so often, but you won't come. I reached out to you and you paid no attention. You ignore my advice. It rejected my correction. So I will, uh -oh, watch this. Why, this is God's word. So I will <clears throat> laugh when you are in trouble. I will mock when disaster takes over, when calamity overtakes you like a storm, when disaster engulfs you like a cyclone, and anguish and distress overwhelm you. When you cry for help, I will not answer. Though they anxiously search for me, they will not find me. For they hated knowledge and chose not to fear the Lord and rejected my advice and paid no attention when I corrected them. Therefore, they must eat the bitter fruit of living their own way, choking on their own schemes. For simpletons turn away from me to death. Fools are destroyed by their own complacency, but all who listen to me will live in peace untroubled by fear of harm. See what he's saying? Those that are rejected, they're going to call out and it's going to be too late. Why? Because Jesus was coming back to judge. And at that point, when he comes back, it's too late. It's too late. And he had the wisdom for him, and the world rejected the wisdom of him. So, in other words, it's time to seek God's wisdom through his word before the Christ. In other words, God doesn't reject us. But here's the idea. The premise is that it's time to seek God's wisdom through his word before the crisis hits. Because when the crisis hits, you know what happens to the ground we're standing on? It gets real shaky. Right? That's, why the, that's why the hymn says, On Christ, the solid rock I stand, all other ground is shifting sand. In other words, man, when things start to shift, when things go bad, you want to make sure you're standing on a rock. That you're not standing on sand that's going to knock you and take, take you out. So we confirm our commitment to God uh, in a time of suffering by, by, uh, through corporate prayer, by having a high view of God's sovereignty, and, and knowing and applying his word. And then lastly, what do we do? We need to look and imitate Jesus as God's holy servant. Isn't that interesting? Jesus, the great description of Jesus is he is God's. So that means he works for God. Holy servant. So if Jesus was a servant, then shouldn't we be servants? Shouldn't we look at ourselves that way? And the scripture is going to tell us that here. Um, <clears throat> so what does it say? It, he calls Jesus God's holy servant in verse 27 and verse 30. Interestingly, he also calls David in verse 25 God's servant. Doesn't say holy servant, God's servant. Now, the Greek there. Is two, there, there's three different Greek words for servant in this in these passages. The first one is um, the first one if for David is um, in verse 25 can be translated son. So it's different from God's holy servant, which is who Jesus was in verses 27 and 30. But then what's really interesting, if you go down to verse 29, look at verse 29. It says, "And now, Lord, take note from your threats and grant your bond servants." So now they're talking about themselves. So that Greek word is bondservant. Because in some translations, you may it may say in verse 30, may say the name of your, um, oops, sorry, in your, it, it may say just servant. So it separates Jesus as the holy servant, right? David as the son, and us as bondservants. We're slaves. We're slaves. Jesus was not a bondservant, but he was a holy servant doing only what God called him to do. And we are bond servants, we're slaves. So, what is a slave, what is a slave owner, or what is a slave? Can a slave decide anything that he does himself? No, he can't. In fact, the owner has the right to life or death of a slave. They control their lives. In our case, we know that our master is benevolent, and he has our eternal welfare right in place, but 
Um, he had the idea of being a bondservant, like Paul calls himself, a bondservant of Christ, even though he was an apostle, is the idea that we are here. The mindset is we need the mindset of Jesus, who was God's holy servant. He came not to do, what does the holy servant mean? Not thy, oops, thy will. All summed up in the garden right there. Not thy will. Right? Jesus always went and conferred with the Father to see what to do. I mean, if I could get there 10% of the time, I'd be making progress, right? I operate so much, just I think this is right, boom, go. Or worse, I've done this a bunch of times, right? So I'm sure this is the way to go. Well, go study David, and he would go against the Philistines, and he'd go three days in a row the same route, and he'd whip them. And then, so the fourth day, if it was me, I'd just go the same way, and I'd get killed. But David, this time he said, no, nope, don't go left, go right. I'm paraphrasing, but that's what it said. That's what it is. In other words, he constantly sought the Lord's counsel in what he was doing. That's what we think. Jesus constantly sought the Father's will for what he was doing. That's what we need to do. We need to be bond servants, right? The time, in a time of persecution or trial, we have to remember, we're not our own. We've been bought with a price. Therefore, we must glorify God with our bodies, even if it means martyrdom. It's hard to think because we don't get we don't have martyrs, Christian martyrs in this country. Go to Nigeria. They have a lot of them. Go to a lot of different places. A lot of martyrs. There's more Christians being persecuted today than any time in history. There's a, there's an idea we can do. Huh? There's a goal we can have. We can pray for the persecuted church. I read a story of a, of a, a North Korean Christian who was in a you know, concentration camp, whatever they call it over there, and they, they put him, he got to go, he, he got his job was out in the slit trenches, which is where you know, all the defecation happens, and cleaning out the slit trenches. And he said he loved it. It was the best place to be because nobody, none of the guards, none of the North Koreans that had, would be anywhere near him, and guess what? So as he was slopping the stuff, he could sing and praise the Lord and not get killed for it. Because hmm. nobody else was around him to hear him. Interesting. So we respond to persecution and suffering. Here's so our second one is affirming our commitment to the Lord's people. So we come down here to number two. So we've got to be committed. We got to be committed to each other as brothers and sisters of Christ because we're family. That's the idea behind that. So we respond to persecution and suffering first by affirming our commitment to God. That's what we saw in our verses, right? Secondly, what we're going to confirm our commitment to God's people. And here's the commitment to God's people as it comes through. They had a corporate mindset, and it's difficult. Um, Jay was mentioning this earlier. Do you know any other Christians whom you can meet with during the week for mutual encouragement and prayer? We need that. We need that. We need to develop a sense of community, belonging to a body of Christians, right? Um, they, got, they were committed to unity. Part of this, committed to the Lord's people, you would say number A would be unity. And we know that they had unity, right? Because they were all of one accord. And it says that in verse 25. They were with one accord. They had come together. They lifted up their, their voices, right? Um, and then thirdly, in that, the Lord's people should be committed to generosity. And we see that at the end. It's interesting. Um, he says in 32 through 35, when the congregation of those who believed were of one heart and soul, there's our unity, right? And not one of them claimed that anything belonging to him was his own, but all things were common property to them. And they had great power, and with great power, the apostles were giving testimony to the resurrection of the Lord Jesus and the abundant grace upon all of them. For there was not a needy person among them, for all the owners of land and houses would sell them and bring the proceeds of the sale and lay them at the feet of the apostles, and they would distribute it to each, to each person's need. Now, it's not communism. This is not communism. Never was, right? Um, because in communism, people are what? They're forced to share everything. These people weren't forced to share anything. In fact, remember what Paul said. Paul taught if a person doesn't work, you know, food. So it wasn't a welfare system. Right? Um, but remember, constantly through Scripture, Old Testament and New Testament, we have them, so we're going to see in the New Testament here in Acts, 
in a couple of chapters. We saw in the Old Testament is that they had to come together to do what? There were widows and orphans. The concept of widows and orphans, you have to go back in time and, and look at the context, is that widows and orphans, I mean, they were on their own. And so somebody had to take care of them. And the church had to take care of them. That was the idea. So uh, rather than enjoining involuntary generosity, the idea is if we see a brother in need, then we do something about it. When we studied 1 John several months back, 1 John 3.17 says, But whoever has the world's goods and sees his brother in need and closes his, watch this, here's the key, and closes his heart against him, how does the love of God abide in him? We see a brother in need. And don't just think material needs necessarily. It's spiritual needs as well. But it is, it is that. So persecution and suffering strips us of our material focus. It helps us remember that things don't last. What does last? Relationships last. Right? Souls last in eternity. If What if by giving in that way? So if we see church members, family members, um, which are members of the body of Christ, um, and then we're more inclined to obey. If, if we look at, in our, sorry, mess it up. If we look at church, our church as family, we're more inclined Amen. to share. Amen. And again, the sharing, it don't just think, hey, man, am I supposed to sell my house and give the money? If God calls you to do it, then sure. But that's not what this passage means. This passage, just like he said, just like James says, right? If I, He says, I'll show you my faith by my actions. You see a brother who's naked and cold and go, hey, stay warm, dude. No. You, you give them what they need. When we face persecution, we need to reaffirm our commitment to the sovereign Lord and to his church. That's the idea behind it. Um, in fact, we have a you know we have a benevolence fund. This church does. We collect cash on certain time, certain time days of the year, certain Sundays of the year that goes in that the deacons have full control over. When there is a need of somebody in the church, then they have the discretion to use that money to fulfill that need. That's that's the idea we're talking about. So if you give to the benevolence fund on those days of giving, knowing that somebody is going to you, the deacons are going to use that money to help a brother or sister in Christ who is in financial need. But maybe somebody just needs help at their house, right? And we give of ourselves to go help them fix something or do something. And then the last part, the third one, is we respond to persecution and suffering by affirming our commitment to the Lord's work. So what's the Lord's work? Gospel. The Lord's work is the gospel. It's presenting the gospel, sharing the gospel. That's ultimately God's work, right? Is I mean that everything about what we do, everything we do with VBS, ought to ought to be focused on what? Sharing Jesus Christ with little children and maybe adults that don't know Jesus. It's all about Him, right? So it's interesting. They didn't run away. The apostles didn't run away and say, oh, oh, they're persecuting us. Let's go make them, let's go hide in a monastery. Rather, they responded by praying in boldness. With great power, the apostles were giving testimony of the resurrection of the Lord. What that says in verse 33 is that through all the mess going on, right? The per well, what are we going to do? Can you imagine people are asking, I'd be the crazy person. Asking. Well, if they're persecuting us, what should we do? Should we arm ourselves? Or I mean, do we go after them? Do, what do we do? And you know what John and Peter were focused on? The great power of the apostles were giving testimony. Focus on Jesus is what he kept saying. Focus on telling people about Jesus. We've got to get more people saved. We've got to get more people saved. And if persecution comes, persecution comes. Don't focus on it. That's why you read through that whole prayer. Not one time did they ask for their own needs to be met. Not one time did they say, don't let the persecution come. Not at all. In fact, go back. This is a, this is a great verse. Verse 29. Now, Lord, take note of the threat. Hey, by the way. We know the persecution is out there. We know you do because you're sovereign. And, and he says, and grant your bond service. Grant us that we may speak your word with all confidence and boldness. That's what they asked for within that. Rather than praying for boldness. Isn't that cool? They responded to the persecution by praying for boldness. The point is their focus was not on themselves. Rather, it was on what? What God wanted, right? And how to extend the kingdom through their witness even if there was further persecution. Does that make sense? I hope it does. Um, so we'll close with this. 
The Lord has us here to be a witness of his death, his resurrection, to those who desperately need to find the Savior. <clears throat> People are looking, man. They're so desperate. They're so, they're, they have a, such a need, and they're trying to fill the need with all kinds of foolishness of the world. And God says, hey, man, you've got you, us, you've got the answer for a lost and dying world. And people are seeking something. Help them seek the one who can save their soul for eternity. That's the idea behind this. Often it is our attitude when we are persecuted or dealing with a trial that opens the door for effective witness. Let me say that again. Often it is our attitude when we are being persecuted or we're dealing with suffering or a trial that will open the door to be an effective witness. When someone says, well, man, how are you getting through that? Well, I'm clinging to Jesus, right? There you go. There's, there's the opening you need right there. How are you dealing with that? How are you getting through those things? So that's what we got, and um, we'll pick up next week with Ananias and Sapphira. Dun, 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 dun. We'll see God do some really interesting things all at one point. Amen?